Well, good day and good afternoon to all of my students from Charlotte Christian College and Theological Seminary, and welcome to all of our visitors and our new viewers to this particular series of lessons uh, that are highlighted under Urban Ministry Dynamics. Dynamics because they are taken from God's Word and are seen in that context of application and bringing what you have determined to do by means of your vision and mission, it brings it to life. So welcome uh, to this uh, broadcast uh, today. Uh, we are concluding the particular series that looks at uh, urban community development. And the topic of this particular lesson is surveying the landscape for urban ministry and community development. We're going to look at it in three parts, uh, so uh, we beg your patience uh, and your tolerance and endurance uh, as we go through this lesson, because we want to end up on a vital concept uh, that's called urban mobilization or spiritual mobilization in the city through outpost ministry. So we want to conclude on that note, uh, looking specifically uh, at outpost ministry, uh, which is the term taken from the Old West, but nonetheless it's a biblical concept uh, that we're going to be looking at today. So let's begin uh, with prayer as we typically and normally do. Some of our hearts and go before the God of this universe, the author and the finisher of our faith, and the giver of our free gift of salvation. Gracious God, we thank you for this day and we acknowledge with the psalmist, this is the day that the Lord has made and we rejoice in it and we are glad in every moment that you've given us because you have given us abundant life and you've given us so many things to be thankful for. Anoint the message, anoint the hearts of the hearers that they may become doers of your word and prosper in the things that you call them to. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, amen, students. Uh, let's get into this lesson once again entitled Surveying the Landscape for Urban Ministry and Community Development. The lesson is in three parts, part A, B, and C. Uh, quickly, part A is eight components of Christian community development, taken from Dr. John Perkins' concept of Christian community development, and Bob Lupton, uh, the two have collaborated uh, for this, and uh, we're going to share those concepts with some elaboration on contemporary issues uh, in our society, our city today. Uh, B, part B is an overview of the city. We're going to take you through an aerial view of the city, uh, look at the landscape, how it's laid out in five sectors, and uh, begin to identify explicitly what urban is and what it requires for ministry. Then part C, uh, we'll be looking at starting and building urban ministry and community development, uh, how we begin uh, that process. So uh, prepare yourself and let's get excited about what we think, uh, based on the convictions of God in our heart, he's up to in the 21st century. We'll begin with part A, eight components of Christian community development. Now, these components uh, which make up the whole and uh, the mission mantra of Christian community development is the whole church on a whole mission to the whole world with the whole gospel. It is a missional church ministry outgrowth, incarnational missional ministry. Now, we've looked at that concept in other lessons, but it's a missional church, a missional ministry concept. The whole church on a whole mission to the whole world with the whole gospel. Now, these components are in response to the crisis of the gentrification movement that results in the displacement of indigent, indigenous people and spreads them out into apartment complexes in what we have defined as urban proper that you'll see when we take an overview, an aerial view of the city. And uh, adjacent to gated communities, 
suburban pockets, which has agitated another problem and actually spread the problem that existed in our inner city communities. So we've got to do gentrification with justice and become an advocate of low income people who still live in those communities and bring together uh, a middle income, low income people together in mixed income housing. That's the governmental mandate. That was the mandate of Christian community development that the government adopt, adopted in its initial uh, phases. So keep that view in mind uh, as we go to the lesson. Gentrification is not solving the problem. Gentrification is spreading the problem. So we need to keep that thought in mind as we look at uh, the possibilities that are before us regarding ministry to the city. Now, in other words, the displacement of people who live in those or live in those inner city subcultures are actually being spread throughout the city resulting uh, in broader crime, violence, and other issues in the city. Now, the following comp components are taken from Restoring At-Risk Communities, Doing It Together and Doing It Right, edited by Dr. John Perkins. And uh, I have elaborated uh, on these eight concepts uh, for the sake of application to contemporary issues in the city. Now, living among indigenous people will produce compassion and empathy, enable us to identify and understand the problems that are there that help to relate to and understand their conditions. I've had Caucasian friends who have relocated who can substantiate that through their personal testimony. People who relocate become wounded healers, and that's basically a concept, a broad concept uh, taken uh, from uh, foreign missions uh, extracted uh, from the life of Christ. In that light, urban community development is an incarnational missional ministry. I've mentioned that uh, earlier on. However, two things uh, we must consider about relocation. One, everyone is not called to move into an inner city redeveloping community. Two, we can partner with and sponsor people who already live there. Baki talks about three kinds of people uh, in light of relocation. Relocators, not born in the city, but uh, who have moved there. Returners, people who were born there and raised there but left for, quote unquote, a better life, but may return. And number three, remainers. People who stayed behind stayed there to become part of the solution. Now, uh, this is the linchpin of Dr. Perkins, the CCDA, Christian Community Development Association. Relocation. But everyone is not called to relocate. I, I think, uh, in my estimation, a biblical truth, uh, like anything else that's effective in ministry, Relocation is a missionary call to go into those home mission fields in our urban community. Number two, the second component is reconciliation, which uh, I hold dearly to my heart and have never given up on as some reconcilers have going back into the 90s. Reconciliation is at the heart of the gospel. We don't need to dwell on that point. Christian community development uh, is very much evangelistic in the sense of reconciling people with God and bringing them together in fellowship uh, where uh, they display their disciple faith to others by putting on display the grace of God through reconciliation. By this, Jesus said, shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have one, if you have love one for another. John 7, uh, 17, 21 says, uh, Neither do I pray for you, but I pray for others, that as I and the Father are one, so you might become one that the world might believe that you, Father, sent me. That is to say, when multi-ethnic, uh, diverse cultural people come together in the body of Christ, it validates the gospel. It authenticates the gospel. 
it sends a positive message to the world around us that Jesus Christ is real. So don't negate or neglect reconciliation one to another in this world's system as a means of a demonstration of the gospel. Uh, we'll examine that as we go on, uh, but here is a non-rhetorical question as we go to the third component. Can the gospel that reconciles people with God without reconcile pe reconciling people with people be the true gospel of the kingdom of God? And I think you'll have to admit no. If we cannot reconcile one with another, then we're not following a horizontal plane of bearing our cross, being a disciple of Jesus Christ. How can I love God that I do not see and hate my brother that I see and take out of the equation like because we have taken that word like over the top. When you look at the Greek grammar behind Jesus asking Peter three times if he loved him, the last time he asked is the reference, do you like me? Now, we don't necessarily have to like the ways of people, but under the mandates of God's word, his commission, and his spirit, we should love everyone from our hearts. And if we love them from our hearts, we'll get to know them and like them. So let's take all of those uh, sayings uh, that I refer to as the wisdom coming from below out of the equation of what we do in ministry. Now, the third component is redistribution. Equitable redistribution of resources. This is significant. Emphasis is on people because people are our most precious commodity and resource. Reconciliation produces people of need coming together with people of resources. That's one of the intricate uh, components of reconciliation. In simple, plain, layman's language, it brings together people with money with people who don't have the money. And that's important. Justice has left out our indigenous communities economically because people of resource have left and abandoned those communities. It began with white flight in the 50s and 60s, followed uh, by brown flight uh, in the 80s and the 90s, now simply being followed by green flight money. People are fleeing uh, those uh, declining communities because they have money to get out. Ah, but the equation of the day says gentrification is bringing them back. So let's keep that in mind. It is about helping people help themselves become self-sufficient, God-reliant. I like to use those terms, self-sufficient, God-reliant. That is to say, I'm, I'm going to rely on God and he's going to give me enough to manage my whole life, my total life, and enable me to invest in others. That's what discipleship produces. Uh, the fourth component, leadership development, a key component. I call it indigenous leadership development. There are status quo leaders, uh, longstanding leaders who get all of the validation, but indigenous leaders very seldom get validated, and they need validation. One example of an indigenous leader that I consistently use is the woman at the well. There are indigenous leaders within those urban communities who don't have uh, any particular title, but they, ha but they have great influence over people in that community. And dreaded to say, drug dealers, uh, those who are involved in prostitution, those are, are just common people uh, who are looking to substantiate, and I'm not making an excuse uh, for illicit uh, or, or vice activity, but I'm saying uh, those are people who look to supplement their income in a society uh, where minimum wage is an audacity. It's absolutely ridiculous because it's poverty. And I'm not saying those things with any sense of justifying their activity, but to point out there are people within those communities who have influence over people who live there who need to be validated. If they are recognized as leaders and brought alongside of the status quo leaders and empowered uh, to do what we think we can do, they'll make tremendous strides in those communities, changing those communities 
in the lives of people through the gospel. Indigenous leadership training is most important. That's the fourth component. The fifth component, component is listening to the community. Typically, uh, most of us who are Eurocentric in our perspective, and that's not a racial term, but it's a multi-ethnic term that has to do with socioeconomics. You can be black, white, Latino, or Asian, but you can have a Eurocentric suburban mindset towards the city. And what you do in ministry is a top-down approach uh, of charity, mercy, ministry that really gives you a feel-good experience in projects that you leave and never build a relationship with people. So listening to the community is about that feel good feeling versus the felt needs of the people. We gotta listen to the people because they know what's best for them better than we do. The indigenous leaders and the people who live there. The community has their own solution to their problems. Keep that in mind. No one is a messiah coming in on their white horse to change things. The people have solutions to their own problems. We just have to listen to them and empower them to change people and to change their community. When we uh, listen to their needs and empower them to change their community, things begin to happen in light of the book of Acts, where after Paul's missionary journeys, uh, the, the results, the residue uh, of his church planting, his ministry development was about joy throughout that city. That'll be the result. Now, the sixth component, the component rather, is church-based community development. Some think that it's best that the local church become the base of operation for community development. That's okay. But uh, I think uh, it's best to develop nonprofits, independent, autonomous nonprofits who partner with churches and other entities for urban community development. I call that the outpost, ministry outpost concept that we'll hear in the conclusion. Now, the church uh, develops the parish concept. It becomes the hub to the wheel. Uh, everything revolves around that church. That can take place too, especially uh, if the church uh, is not imposing its culture on that community. But I think it is absolutely best to develop autonomous, independent, Nonprofit, faith-based community uh, development associations in those communities that I call outpost ministry. Now, seventh component is a holistic approach. Now, we know what holistic means. We're not talking about H O L uh, I uh, S T I C, uh, which has to do uh, with the total healing and remedial remedial effects of the person. A holistic in terms of bringing in all the pieces of the puzzle that restore life. So when we're talking about holistic, we're talking about all the pieces of the puzzle that restore a person's life. Uh, the Good Samaritan scenario. Meeting the felt needs of their spiritual lives, of their social life, of their economic life, their political life, their cultural life, their emotional life, their physical life, their moral life, their judicial life, their educational life and family issues of each person. And this is key. When you address the heart of the needs of the human condition and you relate that to the ethos of the gospel, the heart of the gospel, from the heart of the gospel, a springboard takes place that meets all of those other needs that I mentioned. If we are effective in meeting those needs, it begins with a spiritual perspective. This is a difficult process uh, for most people, especially those who have a Eurocentric uh, suburban mindset for ministry, because what happens in that context, people in that context have been so insulated by money, they get emotionally drained and uh, their energy is exasperated when they involve themselves in a holistic approach. They can't take it. They can't deal with it. Well, if you can't take it and you can't deal with it, empower somebody else in the indigenous community to do it. Bring your resources together with that person of need. Now, but that's the reason why it's difficult. This is why the church must be involved in the different aspects of a person's life through networking. 
Uh, networking is the trend of the 21st century. Uh, relationship is most important. Uh, one of the things that I teach uh, regarding networking, especially uh, in a corporate culture, churches are within a corporate culture too, is that when you take the benefit from the midst of people who are networking, when you take it away, the project or the program or the ministry goes away because it's basically what's in it for me. So we've got to put the benefit before people and collectively as co-laborers move towards that benefit. That's what I believe uh, the biblical concept of networking is. Putting the benefits before us and striving together to achieve those benefits rather than putting those benefits in the middle of us and when the benefit disappears, so do we. People of resource coming together with people of need. Now, uh, the final component of Christian community development here is empowerment. Keep these components in mind. The old model creates dependency or spiritual welfare, charity, mercy, ministry. No doubt, emphatically, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. It builds dependency or spiritual welfare. But scripture really teaches empowerment or restoration. That's the discipleship process. The Old Testament demonstrates restoration in three ways, what or Lupton, Bob Lupton refers to as God's welfare system. This is God's welfare system. We create opportunity for people to get their needs met, too. We work with them to achieve those opportunities. And three, it affirms their dignity because at the end of the day, they'll say, I, I did this with God's help. It affirms their dignity. That's empowerment, beloved. Keep those principles in mind. Now, B, let's go to uh, the overview of the city. We're going to try to rush through this teaching because, uh, as you know, uh, you can't spend a few minutes uh, dealing with the complexities of the city. But uh, bear with me uh, as we go through an overview or an aerial view of city life. There are three population movement definitions. Uh, that we should begin with first. I define the movements of population trends in the city and out of the city in three terms, reurbanization, gentrification, and urban sprawl. When these trends are measured against demographic study, they predict growth in various areas of the city. Sociologists and urbanologists refer to them as migrant-immigrant stream. Now, if urban ministers and urban ministries follow the stream, they will encounter God's hardest. Uh, you don't have to be a, a demographer to identify where God's harvest is located. Follow the migrant immigrant stream. Here's my saying for that. Where people of God are going, God's spirit is flowing. Jump on the wave and follow God's stream to the city. Now, urbanization is the movement of people from rural to urban areas. And the resulting increase in the population of the population that resides in the urban uh, uh, sector rather than rural places. In other words, more and more people are crowding out cities all around the world. The spread, it, it, it's also about the spread of urban patterns of culture and social structure. That is, People who live in suburbia, suburbia and other rural areas are becoming like urbanites who are becoming like any inner city dwellers. The verbiage, the language, uh, the terms uh, of speaking, uh, I, I, I call it this, you know, being ghetto has become popular. Because we're adopting the lingo, we're adopting the dress, and we're adopting the pattern. So urbanization is not just about population movements, but... It's about uh, uh, patterns of culture. Keep that in mind. Uh, now, I'm going to skip over some of these things because there's so many uh, things to know here. Uh, but we begin with metropolitan cities. Metropolitan areas are, are a broad area of the city that takes in all five sectors that we'll see uh, shortly. Now, our, our metropolitan cities encompass two geographic areas. So although there's a broad coverage of metropolitan areas, there are two specific uh, uh, geographic areas that we want to concentrate on 
regarding urban. Urban city life, which are developed, industrialized systems and neighborhoods, and rural country life, which are undeveloped real estate and spread out neighbors. So it's important uh, uh, to keep those concepts in mind of the two main divisions of metropolitan cities uh, as we go through this particular lesson. Now, the first part of our metropolitan cities uh, is the core of urban communities. Uh, cities encompass urban, but the core are your urban communities and, and has developed into three demographic communities residing in three uh, uh, geographical areas, as, as you'll see soon. Center city, inner city, subcultures. They're, they're still inner city subcultures, although gentrification is moving them out and will eventually take over, but they're still inner city subcultures there and urban proper, uh, what I refer to as a new sector that has developed over the last 10 plus years, although you won't see it on many of your maps uh, of demographic studies of the cities, uh, it, it is an urban proper and we'll identify it shortly. The second part of metropolitan cities separates from the urban community by the suburban community. Suburbia developed because of historical desegregation and inter integration. Everybody lived in the, in the city in the 20s and 30s and the 40s and going up into the 50s when uh, segregation uh, was uh, ousted by desegregation and led into civil rights. That led to mass migration of Caucasian uh, economically capable people leaving those cities and developing suburbia. So suburbia hadn't been around here since this country started. It's, it has resulted in the replication of center city life in a rural or suburban setting. Keep that concept in mind. The core of urban community. The core of the urban community encompasses the first that we've mentioned. Center city, inner city subcultures, and urban proper. Uh, these are the areas of the city that are experiencing the most growth. I refer to inner city subcultures because given governmental mandates to raise or tear down public housing, uh, Gabrini Green is a typical example in Chicago, one of the most notorious uh, public housing projects uh, in uh, this country. But here's my question in, ter in terms of the spread of the problem. Did Gabrini Green coming down solve the problem of Chicago? No, the problem got worse. The crime and the death rate is actually higher than death in Afghanistan. So here's my question regarding the spread of the problem. Did tearing down those projects solve the problem? No, it spread the problem. So those are, are, are points of reference to understand the points of this teaching. And uh, the inner city sector is dis diminishing and will eventually be eliminated. So keep that in mind. Inner city the concept, the idea, the residents will eventually go away. And I think, given trends and patterns, that that particular low-income, indigenous, homeless people will move to rural settings through government-funded trailers. Now, I know it sounds uh, like a movie. Well, you know, uh, art, what, imitates life. That's down the road. When it happens, I may be gone from the scene. But uh, send me a memo to heaven and say, you know what, Jarvis, you are absolutely right. Let's keep that in mind. Um, now, uh, from this broad definition of metro, I have defined urban as uh, compassing two main sectors of the city, urban city life and rural country life, as I've stated. Now, let's look at an overview or an aerial view of those five sections of the city uh, that we want to take you through. The aerial view of the city is drawn up in concentric circles like an onion, one layer of the onion on the other, to show how they connect and interact. So get that visual. I don't have a, a graphic diagram, a chart to show you, but get that visual in your mind. Now, this is about future growth trends. Now. Let me help you with a definition of growth trends. 
Growth, tr growth trends are measured by the direction of growth in each area of those five sectors that we're going to go uh, through in the city and examine the nature of population mix between diverse ethnicities and cultures and how it affects relationships and the city's social, political, and economic climate. Now, the heart of the city is in Center City, which is the center of government and commerce. Let's narrow down to those two things. Center City is about the center of government and commerce. So uh, as the city goes out from Center City, it's going to affect policies and politics that's going to affect the city. Remember when Jesus said, what's up you bind on earth and loose on heaven, it's a reference to the elders meeting at the city gate in the Old Testament and coming into 100% agreement for legislation or against legislation. And whatever they agreed upon would be effected in the city. So the growth in the city affects legislation, laws, and politics that affect the city. I hope you get that. It comes out from Center City, the center of government and commerce. But as the city goes outside of the center city, it comes back in and legislation will go back out to affect the city. I hope you understand that ripple effect to see that your involvement as gatekeepers in indigenous communities is absolutely necessary to change policies in the city to affect people. Oh, like the old preacher said, I wish I had a witness in this. Now, the, the growth trends in this teaching, teaching teachings are not uh, reflected like demographic studies or economists who study the city. You can, you, you can gain trends, uh, economical trends, from an, an economist study. Uh, of the financial demographic of people. So what I'm saying is uh, this teaching is about social trends and not about that. And so you'll understand that in a moment. We're not looking at statistical uh, reports or data. But this teaching is based purely on urbanization trends. Now, like economists and financial planners and developers who predict financial growth in various markets based on trends, City cross sections, this teaching is a process for measuring social trends, not a demographic study based on data and statistics, once again. Rather, it is based on social trends of population movements that can be compared to demographic data and st statistics to determine ministry growth and identify places for ministry. Let's begin with Center City. Are you ready for it? Center City is at the center uh, of the circle, that concentric circle, as I mentioned. As you can see from uh, your visual of that, Center City cannot, can only grow in and up. Well, let me rephrase that. Uh, that that's an error on my note. Center City can grow up and out up in terms of skyscrapers, out in terms of acquiring and, and getting acquisition for property that was once in our inner city, our inner cities rather. So Center City can grow up and it can grow out. Now that's, that's the social trend. Uh, <clears throat> keep that in mind. Let's look at now uh, inner city subcultures. From an aerial view, that second concentric circle, historically, center cities have been located adjacent to our center cities and around our inner cities. That's a historical fact. So from that aerial view, uh, looking down on this chart, our inner city subcultures are the next layer and they border a center city historically beginning with the early development of, of ghetto community during the turn of the century and leading up to mass migration and immigration through the 20s, 30s, and 40s into our inner city area. Uh, immigrants, European immigrants, 
during the 40s, 50s, up into the 60s, early 60s, occupied ghetto communities before segregation laws forced African Americans under new legal codes of segregation to move into those ghetto communities. So I want you to understand that ghettos, ghettos were not created for African American people. Uh, they developed uh, in the city uh, because of, of early development through urbanization and industrialization and became the home of European immigrants who would live uh, in poor conditions, work long hours for low wages in bad conditions. Now that's a historical scenario that you can uh, Google if you like to find out. That's why those inner cities were located around center cities. Keep that in mind. Urbanization uh, indicators suggest that inner city subcultures cannot grow in. They're not going to grow further towards uh, center city because center city is growing out and they're being eliminated by center city. And studies also, trends also indicate that those subcultures cannot grow out because gentrification is moving in. So inner city subcultures are stuck in the middle and are slowly being squeezed out. The life is being squeezed out of them and it's being separated and segregated and spread throughout the city. Keep that point in mind. The third layer from uh, that view is urban proper. Now, a, 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 a city proper is the area contained within city limits. This is a new term that will gain momentum in uh, times to come. Uh, city proper is one of the three basic concepts used to define urban area population. For me, and my perspective and view of it, it's relatively new because gentrification began with urbanization. It began with the busters, the Gen Xs, the, Gen, the Ys, and the Zs coming from suburbia, not liking the suburban culture, and wanting to live where they worked and played in Center City, where they worked in corporate America, where they played in the clubs and the entertainment places, wanting to live there, they trekked, they migrated out of suburbia and a residue of those trekkers, particularly the busters, the offspring uh, of the baby boomers, stayed in that urban proper area and the XYZ moved on to the center city, rather uh, adjacent to the center city in former inner city neighborhoods. Now keep that uh, particular uh, viewpoint uh, in mind as we continue. So urban proper is a relatively new uh, development. I live in University City adjacent uh, to the University of North Carolina uh, at Charlotte and uh, this is a booming neighborhood but I consider it urban proper. It's between suburbia, gated communities, and it's in between uh, center city with segments of inner city in between and it has quite a few uh, former inner city residents. This is the new development over the last 10 plus years or so. That's an area of concern. Now, uh, uh, urban proper is moving in, particularly not moving out because it has come from that direction, which means urban proper is moving through the gentrification stream, acquiring inner city neighborhoods and relocating inner city residents. I hope you're getting an aerial view of the picture. Now, suburbia. Uh, urbanization patterns suggest that suburbia is only interested in growing out towards rural, undeveloped communities. But that's going to affect the energy crisis, uh, limit uh, 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 what we do, do in terms of urban sprawl and annexation. Uh, we're talking about uh, annexing other county property and coming uh, into uh, debate and uh, political dialogue with other cities. But that's where suburbia is moving. Suburbia is moving out. Now, the final one is rural communities. There's quite a bit of undeveloped property in rural communities. I believe it's going to be 
the next location in this modern culture for indigent, homeless, low-income people in governmental supplied trailers. I know it sounds a little far-fetched. Sounds like a great movie, though, doesn't it? Well, I believe that's the future. So uh, get back to me in 10 years, and we'll see what happens. Now, let's, let's get to the conclusion. Starting and building urban ministries and community development. Now, uh, I'm going to go through quickly. There are several concepts that segue one into the other to make this happen. I'm not going to go over the definition. It begins with urban demography, doing your studies. Then it moves to urban theology, uh, getting the God talk and the proper theology for building urban community development associations. Then it moves into urban evangelism, and evangelism outreach to the gospel in that community, similar to the movement in the book of Acts, making converts, building core groups from, that con from those converts, goes into urban discipleship, maturing them to Christ-likeness. Then it goes into urban uh, ministry uh, that deals with cross-cultural outreach and development because you're going to uh, see tons of multi-ethnic people and you need to learn how to reconcile it. Then you come into developing your nonprofit for urban community development. Now, uh, let's close with the concept of spiritual mobilization through outpost ministry in the city. And I hope you've been blessed uh, with this, and I hope it makes sense to you. Uh, for me, it makes great sense, and it's very simple, because uh, through God's Spirit, my diligent study, I've gleaned it from the book of Acts. This isn't new. It's something that has existed since the church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. Let's close with spiritual mobilization throughout post ministry in the city. Uh, this is where I think you need to develop your autonomous independent nonprofit for your urban community development association. Indigenous urban or inside out ministry is the Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 way of evangelism and discipleship. You can read that for yourself. It enables the one being discipled to reproduce the same ministry in others, multiplication. It is a tailor-made kingdom of God principle for servant leaders to, to divest themselves of selfishness. Philippians 2, 5 through 9. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He divested himself of his divine prerogative to act as God. He could act as God and did act as God only when it was in league with the will of the sovereign father who hovered over his, over his son. Servant leaders give their lives away for the purpose of empowering potential indigenous leaders they serve. Servant leaders give their lives away. They divest themselves of selfishness. This is spiritual mobilization, beloved. The process of empowerment raises the indigenous leader up and enables them to do the work of ministry. It lifts them up. And it puts you in a position of supervision over them. You become their coach. You become their mentor that they highly respect. It doesn't eliminate your role in ministry, but it actually elevates it. Because if we humble ourselves, Scripture says God will exalt us. Now, this is the most effective, time-sensitive way to do ministry to our inner city sub-pockets in our urban community, but the most difficult for those who serve because it releases them for, from their power and control over people. And that is the biblical mandate, to be released from power and control over people. Matthew 20, 25 through 28. His disciples had egos too. And, and they and, and family members wanted to know who was going to come into the highest seat of authority next to Christ and his kingdom. And basically Christ said, none of you, or better yet, it'll be the least of you. Because the world exercises that kind of ego, that kind of authority and accountability over people. But, but in the kingdom of God, you don't exercise that kind of authority and control over people. 
As a matter of fact, you've released your, your power, your authority and control over people, and you put it in my hand through a personal relationship with them. The indigenous leader submits to the leadership of the servant leader and becomes teachable and amenable to their instructions. Now, this process of spiritual mobilization then engages the servant leader into coaching, consulting with, guiding, and directing the indigenous leader. No greater position in ministry. The servant leader's sole role at that point is to encourage and motivate the indigenous leader to win at the Christian life. That's it. It's not about a program. It's not about a process. It's not about this. It's not about that or the third. It is about encouraging that indigenous leader to live for Christ. And out of his living, out of her living will flow ministry. I call it tailor-made ministry. Out of your heart shall flow rivers of living water. We don't need a patent program to conduct ministry. All we need is the emphatic work of the Holy Spirit in context of his word. And don't get that twisted as fundamentalism, but it boils down to that simplicity. The indigenous leader's work of ministry will then flow out of Christian living. That's the, the simplicity of it, beloved. Now, leveraging ministry. In the initial stages of growth, and in order to free up funds for operations, staffing, and ministry, a marketing plan will attract other individuals and organizations who are concerned about urban life, including businesses and faith-based organizations that have a like passion for broken humanity and the restoration of declining communities. I know that's a mouthful, but listen to what it means. It means you have to draw up your marketing plan, and your marketing plan is like discipleship. There are three phases to marketing. Moving product from producers to people. The three P's, producers. Those who rally around the vision. The God-given vision. Those are the producers. Product. That's the gospel. And it's covenantal benefits, resources, promises, and provision. The gospel carries covenant rights with it. And it brings provision. Then people. How do we move that product from the producers? To the people, developing your outpost ministry in the city. This process initiates the formation of partnerships and with suburban and urban churches through bridge building and networking to connect people of resource with people of need. I hope you are blessed by this teaching and broadcast today. Join me for others. Uh, we're putting together what I feel is a profound teaching about the 21st century church and what's happening within the church. Join us for that, and we will see you next time. God bless you.